I'd like you all to cast your minds back to another trial held right here. A trial that was as trumped up as this one when I was tried for stealing water. Water that had been planted in my room. Objection, this is irrelevant. What is your point, Bray? My point is that Danny is as innocent as I was then, and I'm going to prove it. So where's your evidence? If Danny was so clever, why did she leave the poison in her room? She must have known we were going to search the place. There's a whole city out there where she could have hidden it. You see, she was framed. So welcome to Series 2, Episode 21 of Conversation on Eagle Mountain, a podcast about the tribe. I'm your host, Lance, and joining me on the podcast panel today is Liz. Hello. Sabine. Hi. And Carlin. Hello. We have episode notes done by Matt and myself. So Series 2, Episode 21, the screenplay was done by David Fox. It was directed by Janet Stubbins. And the episode synopsis were read out by Sabine. Lex takes advantage of Celine's kindness and burns his bridges with Ryan and the mole rats in the process. Danny is caught in a lie at her trial and Bray sets out to uncover the truth. But will he like what he finds? Continuing on from the previous episode, Celine appears to be getting through to Lex, who admit that she's the only person he can talk to since Sandra died. Under the influence of alcohol, however, Lex takes their connection too far and tries to force himself on her, becoming angry when she explains that she was only trying to be his friend. So, panel, uh, what were your feelings um, about these scenes as they progressed? And did you think that Lex was beginning to open up or was it always going to end badly? To me, it felt that he was finally opening up. So I, I was really glad to see that. But yeah, it kind of felt like it was always going to end badly with him because let's face it, it's Lex. And alcohol does not make Le- Lex a better person. I can't even blame the alcohol. Lex has done this completely sober. So. Yeah. You know what I mean? With the alcohol, there's even less boundaries for him. Mm -hmm. Right. So even a part of his brain that might say, oh, this might not be a smart thing to do with my best friend's girl. Even that part is now uninhibited. I think it's absolutely crazy how we're only in season two and there's nothing that surprises me that Lex has done. (laughs) I was like, oh, he couldn't do anything like worse. He couldn't be more of a scumbag. And then he just does another thing like this. Um, I mean, yeah, he's clearly done this without the alcohol. And then he's done it with the alcohol. And um, it's just honestly, I mean, he has to go at this point. Mm-hmm. It's just proof of who Lex is at his core. Like he takes, I don't know how sincere this connection is with Celine. I can't say that. I don't think it's all that sincere, but I could be biased. Um, but maybe I can, you know, there's a benefit of the doubt that he could have actually been feeling a sincere connection with her. I don't know. I honestly don't care at this point. All I know is that when it comes to his relationship with women, Lex's instinct is to take what he wants sexually, whether he's sober or not. Mm -hmm. And that just tells me who he is. And that's it. That's all I got. Like, I can't make any more excuses for this person. You've shown me who you are in the daylight. In the nighttime, this is your go-to. The minute you feel a connection to Celine, the minute you feel any gratefulness for her kindness and the fact that she's being there with you and the fact that you can be vulnerable with her, your next instinct is to try and rape her. I got nothing for you, okay? There's nothing, you know? And, like, I just, I'm out of Fs to give for this character. This is irredeemable. Um, I got no excuses. I don't have any therapeutic advice. Just you're lucky. The only thing that happened to you is you got thrown out Mm -hmm. because I would have done a lot worse to him if he'd done this to me. And not only did he do this to Celine, he doesn't even feel a moment of shame or like, Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I lost my mind. I shouldn't have done that. Celine, you know, anything, any remorse. Instead, he immediately starts victim blaming her. It's your mm-hmm. fault. You were teasing me, you know. And then when he's confronted later, he continues with that. Like, there's no sense of like, I did something wrong. I feel bad. I I took it too far. I shouldn't have done that, or I screwed up, you know, with the one person who was trying to connect with me. He feels nothing. That like, you can't tell me he feels bad for what he did. And 
I'm just done. I'm just like, whatever. Like, I, uh, you're lucky it was Selene you did it too. That's all I can say. Mm-hmm. You're, you're lucky because mm. I wouldn't have left that room with you still going, oh man, I would have taken you out myself. Ryan wouldn't have found anything left to do. <laughs> can you imagine if he would have tried anything like this with either Ebony or Alice? No, I can't imagine that. <laughs> That's just, there would be nothing left of Lex. Yeah, I think, well, one, I feel like Lex's character has been pretty consistent from season one to five. And then seeing this uh, incident that he tried to put it, force himself upon Celine, uh, we do see that throughout the series. So I just only wish that there was a, um, what is, what am I trying to say? A prequel? Like, you know, more flashback episodes to see how Lex developed these uh, destructive uh, uh, behavior patterns. Because he keeps doing it. Yeah. And at that point, it's not a mistake. Mm. I mean, there's a lot mm-hmm. of people who gave him a pass for the Zondra situation. A lot of rape apologists out there. Surprising, but they're out there. A lot of people gave him a pass, you know? It was a mistake. He show- He said he was sorry. He accepted that he was wrong, blah, blah, blah. What happens the second time? It's not a mistake. It's a character flaw. That's just mm-hmm. who you are. That's your go-to. In the same way that Ebony's go-to to get rid of threats is to try and kill them. That's just who she is. It's not a crime of passion anymore. It's her go-to coping mechanism to get rid of somebody, you know? And for Lex, this is his. And you can't look at me and say, well, no, he's not. A... Yeah, he is. He is. That's what he is. You know what I mean? Um... That's what he has to learn how not to be. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's pretty much the only thing Lex learns in five seasons is not to do that, you know. And I was actually looking at the comments just to get a feel on how people had felt about this episode. And I can't tell you how disgusted I am at how many people said I feel bad for Lex in this episode. I was like, no way. I am. I'm not lying, you guys. Like you don't. You shouldn't see a single comment after an episode like this of someone saying i feel sorry for lex and what really blows my mind is how few people said i feel sorry for celine Mm. you know yeah i was like wow i mean granted fortunately the majority of people were like wow did lex kind of come into him i'm so glad someone called him out but the fact that i found any comments and said i feel bad for lex you know some of them had the whole well i know he's a bad person but i feel bad for him or whatever but i just couldn't believe i found any I'm like, wow. Even now, you 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 feel bad for him after seeing this. I don't know what to say to you. I got nothing. That is quite shocking. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I can understand why someone would feel bad. I mean, it is like you're you're kind of like this overseer just watching someone from their life from beginning to to the near end, and you're just kind of just seeing them do all the wrong mistakes. And you know, sure, it is a TV show; it's entertaining to watch, but you can't help but to try to feel something for the characters and and i mean lex is very well written in my opinion he's probably like the second best well written character on the show so i mean i have empathy for him not for this situation but for him as his character for the mistakes he's done sorry i got nothing (laughs) if you can i'm sorry if you like if you tell me that overall you feel bad that there are people like lex in the world who are so broken they can't get it together and they just keep destroying their lives i can respect that but if you look at this episode and tell me that you feel bad for lex in this episode i got nothing Mm -hmm. for you i got nothing to say like this i guess we're not having a discussion about this because i got nothing for you if you can tell me that you feel bad for the rapist in this i'm sorry i i'm i'm just not with you and i'm not gonna discuss it (laughs) right right and i think and i think you're absolutely right on that i think people's uh emotional feel for this episode is not towards i think they're maybe they're not conscious that it's towards oh i feel bad for for lex but really they're i think they're feeling bad for just the what the world has done to this done to this human being for it starts with maybe from and again we don't know this because the show never showed it but maybe like his relationship with his mother his father growing up and then all this stuff i feel more sad just for the world maybe not for lex certainly i mean ultimately that doesn't really matter what whatever lex has gone through this is <laughs> this is not on this is not acceptable behavior oh yeah of course not of course not we can't feel sorry for him trying to rape me <laughs> no, no matter his history 
yeah, the moment that any sentiment for Lex can happen is up until the moment he mentions that she's the only one he's been able to connect with since Sandra, but everything he does after that, no way. There's mm-hmm. no, simply no way to feel sorry for him in that. Yeah, I honestly believe that was that one, that was a one genuine moment when he said that. Yeah. That was one moment he really was genuine, but then after that, he just ran with it. And you just can't feel sorry for him. You can't excuse yeah. it. No. <laughs> just... yeah, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's no excusing his actions for that. And then slut shaming her. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah, it's your, it's your fault. You shouldn't have been nice to me. You being nice to me meant you were coming on to me. And it's just like, wow. Like, now you know how that feels, Celine. So, and then also, this whole entire situation kind of just makes me feel a little bit more anger towards Bray. Because I feel like this wouldn't have happened. Because that whole exchange with Trudy shouldn't have happened. Because you should have known who you're letting back into the into the tribe. Yeah, but well, come on, we can't blame Bray for what Lex is doing now. Yeah. I mean, no, you can't blame her for that. But it's still like... I'm trying to think of like a good analogy for it. It's you. You mean if Bray would have let Lex die, then this wouldn't have happened. Yeah, sure, but right. That's yeah. We can't. <laughs> you can't. You can't kill people because of crimes you think they're going to commit. Mm, it's, it's not. I mean, not. I'm pissed at Bray for letting Lex live for numerous reasons, <laughs> but it's not because he should have seen something like this coming. You know, I, on, this is on Lex. You know, um, yeah, we, we just have to, we can't look at elsewhere in the, in the, the spirit of the tribe. We just have to let's focus on him. It is, this is all down to him. Right. Did the rest of the tribe have a conversation with Celine about like what Lex really tried to do? They didn't have to. That's what's so sad about this entire situation. Nobody needed mm. clarification of what Lex did because nobody needed, everybody knew what yeah. Lex did. The minute Celine left that room crying, the minute they saw the minute Ryan sees her crying, his first instinct is he tried to do something to you. He didn't he didn't need any evidence that that yeah, happened. That was so sad. That actually broke me. Like, the fact that Ryan immediately thought, okay, you know what? He actually tried something with you. That's, that's bloody sad. <laughs> the <laughs> so minute, so everybody <laughs> watching Ryan holding Lex over the balcony, nobody needed an explanation. They're like, <laughs> it's Lex. Nobody was like, what? He did what? Nobody needed it. That's the saddest part about this character. That everybody who lives with him knows he's a predator and had no problem believing, like, oh, he did something terrible to Celine. Of course he did. It's Lex. Right. Yeah, because if, and if it had been anyone else but Ryan holding him over that railing, they might have asked questions, asked what Lex had done. But they know Ryan. Ryan doesn't get this mad that easily. Yeah, you're right. He doesn't. But he is fiercely protective of the people he loves. So for him to do this to Lex means Lex must have done something really bad. Hmm. Yeah, let's, let's dive into that. Because, um, yeah, find out about what happened. Ryan confronts Lex, who goes into the point that Ryan attempts to strangle him in front of the rest of the tribe. As Bray intervenes, Lex is ultimately kicked out of the mall. And yeah, we've got loads of questions concerning that. It's like, first up, what does this say about Ryan and Lex? That obviously, like I mentioned, he instantly knew that Lex had tried it on with Celine. Um, yeah, how do you feel about the erosion of Lex and Ryan's friendship? And what do you think about that overall decision to banish Lex? He's lucky that's all they did. He's just lucky. I mm-hmm. would yeah. have, have taken away his one weapon. Like, well, let's make sure you can't do this to anybody else. <laughs> yeah. you, you clearly have a proclivity to doing this. So, so, for the safety of all mankind, <laughs> castration for this one. <laughs> like, seriously, where is this in your Bill of Rights that you guys just signed? You know, uh, you just that's... sent him off into the city to do this to other. All you did was banish him from his tribe. There's no yeah. warning bulletin. There's no announcement to people like, hey, don't let this kid jo- jo- you know, join you. He's a sex offender. They just made him everybody else's problem i'm like that's your answer really that's true yeah (laughs) i am now instantly imagining ellie writing that article you know you're absolutely right liz and i was just thinking about that like i mean i'm totally on board for lex has to leave he needs i mean he has Mm -hmm. to punish way way more for, for that right but i feel like since this whole bill of rights things now exist we should do something, I guess, more legitimate 
to have a punishment for Lex, like a trial that he will be sentenced and he will face time and I, I don't know, whatever jail system they have or whatever, but... Yeah, but they have one cage. What are they going to do? Shove him in with Danny? Right, right, right. Of course. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, th that would be awful. <laughs> I mean, she would have ripped his hair out, yeah, sure, just... but... What good are your Bill of Rights when we have these crimes happen and mm -hmm. there's yeah. no actual consequence? This is a, the first big crime, well, I mean, aside from Danny being framed, this is the big, first big crime you have after your Bill of Rights has been signed. There should be something in writing as to what to be done with someone like this. And just sending him out on the streets, I don't know how that's a punishment for what he's done. Because he can just easily do it to anybody else. And you haven't warned anybody that that's why he's out on the street. You just quietly sent him away you know like a, a pregnant catholic girl you know what i mean like it didn't happen she's mm -hmm. vacationing in the mountains you know and mm -hmm. i just i don't uh, now i'm having flashbacks to the lexus white top with the cross on it and because they sent him out history will repeat itself which shows not only lex is the problem but the entire uh i guess this entire system that they've or at least they're trying to create to try and solve these problems, which is actually just creating more. But that's what, yeah, that's what's bad about it. Because like Liz mentioned, like it's, it's, it's not even like part of the Bill of Rights. It's not even like connected to it. It's just something that's happened. They don't even refer to it. And if you just, you just chucked out, it's like, well, what was the point of signing the Bill of Rights? What was the point of having this system in place, these rules and regulations? And you just, okay, we just kick him out. That's it. All right. I, I honestly wonder what would have happened with this if Danny hadn't been in that cage. And if C would have spoken up. I don't know. She never gets to find out even what happened. We never get nope. her opinion on any of this. Because the mall rats once again swept something under the rug. Mm -hmm. So no one would know that they can't keep it together. That's that's why Lex is thrown out, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think the reason this wasn't dealt with is they already had the Danny situation on their hands. They didn't want another scandal. So they just swept it under the rug. Nobody mm -hmm. needs to know that... Once again, we have an issue in our tribe that we can't handle. So he got swept under the rug. Trudy got swept under the rug. Hell, if Bray could have gotten away with it, Danny would have been swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. That's so smart. Yeah. The, yeah. the Marats are not interested in justice at this point. Mm -hmm. They don't care about justice. And they actually don't care about protecting anybody but their own power base. Yeah. Now I kind of wonder what would have happened if it was Ebony. And if they just sent her out. And about oh well, we'll get to Ebony. I mean, <laughs> like, ineffectual when it comes to Ebony, but um, just to circle back, yeah. I mean, what do you think about Ryan and Lex's well, the state of their friendship at this moment? I think we now have fully seen what Ryan is capable of. You know, I think it's interesting that, and maybe I'm wrong when I say this, but I don't. I would maybe I wouldn't consider Lex and Ryan necessarily like friends they seem more like acquaintances because they just traveled together so much to survive you know their friendship kind of seems like uh like when you're in school and you see someone you know you just say hi to them and you see them every day so you just occasionally just keep saying hi to them i think they're friends i think they're definitely friends but it's a toxic codependent relationship it's not a healthy friendship it's not the kind of friendship anyone should strive for. If you saw someone you love in this kind of friendship, you would obviously try to steer them out of it. Um, but as far as they're concerned, it's friendship. It's probably all they really know of friendship. I suppose I should be sad that, you know, these two... But I'm just not, because I've known for a long time that this friendship is based on Ryan's loyalty and devotion, not on anything Lex deserves. It's not like Lex gives anything back in this relationship. He gives Ryan the mm -hmm. most meager scraps of, you know, sometimes bare praise and just so that Ryan will feel like he's special and that, you know, Lex cares about him. But Ryan has known for quite some time that Lex isn't a good friend to him. And it's just his own strength of character that's kept him around. So for Ryan to finally reach the point where it's just like, I'd kill you myself. You know, I, I don't feel bad. I'm just mm -hmm. like, good boy, good boy, you know? I'm, I'm glad that you realized. I mean, granted, it won't last for long, but I don't know, there's something satisfying of seeing him get to this point. And it felt oddly satisfying to have Ryan hold him over that specific part of the balcony. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, 
things come full circle. I like the fact that Ryan, he doesn't beat Rex up. That's not what he's thinking. He's thinking, I'm going to kill him. Get him mm-hmm. out of this building or I will take his life. I love the fact that he doesn't ask Bray. He doesn't suggest. He tells Bray what's about mm-hmm. to happen. Like, mm-hmm. it's time for you to be a leader. I'm going to kill him or he leaves. So choose which one it's going to be, a oh, leader man. And Bray was like, oh, okay, Lex, I don't want blood on this on the floor. It's horrible to wash out. You have to leave, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm like, bro, you, Ryan. Um, I mean, yeah, Lex, I mean, Ryan's temper, obviously, we will see multiple mm-hmm. times. Um, th- does it shock you at all? Like, do you see where it's coming from? Like, what do you think about it? I think Ryan's temper just gets to this point when he sees injustice. Yeah. And specifically injustice to someone he loves. Because we saw it in the flashback that he was willing to, to be violent for the sake of Lex. Because he felt he was unfairly treated. But the moment someone touches someone Ryan truly loves, he just explodes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think what it really is, is whenever someone threatens something that Ryan is at peace with or something that is keeping Ryan at peace, he will immediately go Hulk on someone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously we've seen that with, with just now with Celine. And then obviously there's going to be numerous of other uh, mm-hmm. situations as well, which is very weird. <laughs> I also think having a family has a huge effect on Ryan. I don't know what Ryan's story was before because the flashback didn't tell us, but I do get the sense that Ryan was alone in some way. And maybe that's part of what drew him to Lex. Lex gave him a family and, you know, so to speak. And so, for example, when you notice the way Ryan is totally okay in the beginning with Lex threatening Jack, Jack is a vulnerable person. This is an unjust way to treat him. But Ryan's okay with it because it's he and Lex and he's got Lex's back. But later you'll see that once the Marats become Ryan's family, he's not okay with Lex treating anyone in their family that way. You know, even someone like Bray, who Ryan doesn't particularly care about. He's like, this is wrong. We're not going to do this. I I think it has something to do with family. The Mm -hmm. Marats become Ryan's family. And that makes them off limits for this kind of behavior. It's not okay anymore. Um, whereas before he really knew them, before he cared about them, he didn't have a problem with Lex barging in and threatening these kids and threatening to do stuff to them. And Ryan was going to back him on it. But once they became his home, Ryan was like, no, we don't do that to our own. We don't do it. It's not okay. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I think coming into his own, finding his self-worth outside of someone like Lex, Finding people who see him and love him, cherish him, and realizing that there's ways to be loved and cherished outside of an abusive friendship like the one he had with Lex and possibly one he had with his own caregivers. I think that's why we see more outbursts from Ryan, you know, a a more sense of assurance in what he believes and what he knows to be right and what's wrong and willing to stand up. He doesn't doubt himself anymore, you know, and... Once you know yourself, there's just the line in the sand becomes much more clear to what you're going to tolerate and what you're going to put a, put up with. No one can, people can no longer fool you into thinking that it's okay to put up with stuff because you're like, no, I know myself and I know this is wrong and I'm not going to do it. So it could explain why as time goes on, we start to see a more menace coming out of Ryan. You know, you're not going to fool me into thinking that what you're doing is okay. I know it's wrong. I don't need anyone to tell me that anymore because I found myself, you know? Yeah. I can see that, but I still think it's him just not being okay with anyone that's disturbing his peace. Cause we see it also in season one with Zandra and Lex doing things completely wrong with trying to frame Bray and whatnot. But because Zandra was his peace in season one, or at least mm-hmm. a good half of it was, uh, he was still willing to let things happen just as long as he has his peace of mind. But you'll notice he changes his mind once he thinks about it. He then says, no, I'm not okay with this. You know, I, I again, I, I do think it was specifically because it was the tribe of Zandra. You know, I don't think he was okay with it happening to anyone. But if you put up the tribe against the relationship he has with Zandra, 
I think it complicated things. But his right. first instinct was to not be okay with it because the mm-hmm. tribe had become his family. And um, I'm just saying that that's the progress I've seen with Ryan. Mm-hmm. It's not a perfect linear line, but... Yeah, definitely not linear. <laughs> um, okay, so, so I mean, this leads on to a scene that I particularly didn't like, but let me see what your, your thoughts about. So in the aftermath of Lex's banishment, Celine assumes that Ryan won't want to be around her, but he reassures her, and the pair decide to sleep together for the first time that very night. Uh, yeah, what did you think of that scene? It says something about Celine that her first instinct is to think that Ryan will blame her too. Mm-hmm. Because we know Celine has a history of slut shaming the victim of sexual assaults. That's the world she grew up in. That somehow it's the female's fault if she is sexually assaulted or harassed. I mean, that's the first thing she did to Zandra. Mm-hmm. And she immediately takes the blame for what Lex said to her. She assumes that Ryan is going to blame her, that he's going to be disgusted with her, and think that she wanted it. That is what society has taught Celine about victims of sexual assault. They must have wanted it in some way. So that's what she assumes Ryan's going to think about her, which is just so sad, but very consistent. Um, and that Ryan has to reassure her, like, I don't blame you for this, Celine. I don't think you did anything to deserve it. You know, I don't think you wanted it. Oh, well, that's interesting that Ryan's like, did you want him? Like, oh boy, you guys have mm-hmm. some interesting issues to work out. I don't know of them having mm-hmm. sex this way was the healthiest. Nope. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, I don't know if that was the best coping mechanism for any of this. Um, I've seen worse times to have it for the first time with somebody, but... I mean, let's just come out right and say it. You know, she was almost raped, and then you go and have sex with the partner you wanted to have sex with. I mean, it, 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 is, weird. Yeah. it is not right. You know why? It's not another way to put it. It's not right. The timing is uncomfortable. Uh, I mean, could be better. No. <laughs> <laughs> it could be better. It, it may be uncomfortable, just even. No, yeah. Yeah, it's, just the idea yeah. of it. I do think there's an odd realism to it, especially when I consider how consistently Ryan and Celine have been written with all their issues, you know, um, with their issues, the kind of people they are. I'm not surprised that this would be their coping mechanism, that this would be the impetus to feeling like they're ready to take this step with each other um again as an adult i look at it and i'm like "Ooh, honey i don't know (laughs) what i'm thinking i'm trying to get back into my teenage brain you know and i do think for them personally they feel they're making a healthy well-informed decision they both feel this is consensual they want it and they they're comfortable with it they're happy with what they did but yeah, if I was their mom or dad, I'd be concerned that this is what led them to finally doing it. But um, I, I do think it's realistic given their age and what often inspires young people to feel like they're ready to take that plunge. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it could have been better. Because in this case, what they really want at the end of the day is to put it behind them and to reassure the other that they're the one they really want. To them, this is the healthy way to do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, as long as you both consented and you feel good about this, I'm going to leave it alone. It's kind of like being happy for Zandra on her wedding night. Like, mm-hmm. hey, was it good for you, sweetie? That's all I care about. Like, <laughs> I'm not saying you should have married this guy, but are you happy? All right, fine. I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it just sums up everything I hate about Ryan to me. I just Ooh, okay. Because I I can't judge them. I in my teenage years have had some questionable bonding time with partners that looking back, like, oh boy, <laughs> we shouldn't have done that. That was not healthy. Um not, not a good idea, but we were young and stupid and 
so <laughs> and it was comforting <laughs> I, mean, I mean that's fine but it was nowhere near this bad like okay he tried to rape you did you want to have sex with him no okay fine let's have sex I mean, come on <laughs> yeah. this, this is, is sad like her story, wanting though. to prove that he's the one who wants to have sex with <laughs> you do know this is a story trope it's the healing penis trope like <laughs> she has a traumatizing sexual experience and the only thing that can fix it is the penis of the right person and he swoops in and he saves her from the trauma so that Celine can know that oh it's wonderful now you know like <laughs> not, all da- not all guys are evil interesting this one <laughs> <laughs> you see it in fiction all the time. Mm-hmm. You have you, you make someone the victim of a sexual assault that could traumatize them towards all sexual actions, and someone swoops in and and shows them sexual pleasure in a healthy way, and then they're cured. And um, mm-hmm. oh, okay, so it's only like sexual assault. Yes, for like with okay, because I was thinking, like, I was like, why hasn't anyone cured Ebony? <laughs> <laughs> no, it has to be someone who's traumatized sexually and then the healing penis usually swoops in it's never a healing vagina unfortunately and um, and, and saves them yeah, yeah, from yeah. any any trauma that they might have had from it and then they're able oh, to go forth without feeling like oh that really messed me up because no you know <laughs> they were yeah, because the magic wand appeared right <laughs> So it's a story trope. I've seen it so many times. Wow, I'm gonna be looking out for that then. <laughs> oh boy, but for the penis that goes bibbity bubbity boop. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I'm trying to think of who else has been assaulted and on the tribe. <laughs> I mean, you guys think about it. You have Lex who comes on to Celine and she's uncomfortable. Lex states to Celine, "I want you. Come on, Celine. You know you want it. It's very traumatizing because she totally didn't." Now look at the way Ryan says it and such a, just a, it, it's, it's lusty, you know, like, I want you, Celine. Oh my gosh. I've seen that in fan fiction so many damn times. <laughs> and it's sort of like, oh my gosh, I am wanted and I'm wanted by the right man in the right way. Let's do this, you know? And yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. If Ryan said it to me, I might go all marginal <laughs> legs too. <laughs> really, Ryan? <laughs> Because I didn't trust him then. You're lying, aren't you? No! I'll tell you why you didn't mention anything. Because your story is a pack of lies. You lied your way into the mall rats, pretending like you were out to save the world. But really, you were out to destroy the antidote. Confess it, Danny. You're spying for the Chosen. As her trial begins, Ebony argues for the prosecution and Bray in defence. So, like, Jenny Panel, how did you think um, their arguments were successful and um, what do you think about the trial in general uh, and also the tribe stars? Uh, I loved Ebony's outfit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just, it was spot on and then Dal being put in charge of it. I love that even more. I think that was very smart. What, I think it was a smart choice but, I mean, his style even matches Ebony's style. It's the same dark blue. So I really like that part, but ah, uh, some of those arguments. <laughs> I really love this trial. Um, it's a showpiece. Mm-hmm. Look how theatrical this whole thing is. Like it, it's just the design, the way it's filmed, the drama of it all. It's like courtroom TV, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm not saying that all of Ebony's arguments are good ones. But the way she's landing them, she understands. She doesn't have to make perfect sense. She doesn't even have to stick to perfect logic. What she needs to do is firmly put doubts in the heads of these people listening. She puts them on a show. She says it with confidence and flair. She's like a Southern Baptist preacher. Can I get a hallelujah up in here? She knows what she's doing when she's talking to these people. She deliberately says things. That, you know, the judge has to, hey, it's sustained or overruled. You can't say that. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. I take it back. That is a prosecutor's move. You said mm-hmm. it anyway. And even if the judge says to the jury, strike that from the record, you're not allowed to put that in your consideration, you can't erase the, ju- the, the nope. jury from having heard it. It's going to influence how they feel, even if they can't use that bit of evidence for proof. 
it's going to influence their feeling on the situation. Ebony knows what she's doing. So again, even though like not all of her points make logical sense, she knows that all it does, it's about the doubt. Just pointing out, we don't know her. What do you know about her? Her behavior is weird. She's unbalanced. She's tricksy. You can't trust her. That's all she needs to get anyone to be like, yeah, you know, she's probably the most logical person to have tried to kill Tyson. Oh, sure. Maybe later they'll think about it and realize that Ebony was a better culprit. Mm -hmm. Ebony mm -hmm. knows what she's doing. Bray is trying to... Oh my gosh, he's, he's trying to do the bleeding heart defense, you know, and sometimes it's like, okay, I get it, but he's not saying it with the confidence that Ebony is, you know, and he's also ignoring many of the points that Ebony's making that, yeah, who the frick is Danny? This is, don't you think this is weird? She's good at leading the argument. <laughs> mm hmm mm hmm I just think it's funny that Ebony believes she's got Bray so wrapped around her finger that she does. She's willing to bring up arguments that if Bray just had the cojones, could completely say she's lying. Mm -hmm. So that's how confident Ebony feels that how she has Bray, you know, um, which is interesting. Um, she has no doubts that no matter what she does, he's going to stay in line. He's not going to give up the bit of evidence that would protect Danny. She's convinced of that, you know, and. Mm -hmm. Wow, to have the confidence of Ebony. <laughs> yeah, it's like Johnny Cochran. Ooh, girl. <laughs> yeah, it's Johnny Cochran all day. So there's so much to talk about uh, this this trial scene or just the whole trial of it. First things first, yes, Ebony looks amazing. The outfits in this episode are iconic. Ebony looks amazing. Mm -hmm. Tizan always looks amazing, her outfits. Somehow Chloe looks like a, a Pokemon with her hairdo. Um, I don't know who said that was a good idea. <laughs> Every comment in the comment section on this could not help say they did Chloe dirty. What happened? It's literally like that one friend who has this outfit and you know it looks bad. And they ask you, how does it look on me? You're like, uh, it looks good. It looks, yeah, it looks, it looks good. Yeah. That outfit, that, that hairdo is absolutely horrible. Um, other than that, I don't understand how people didn't find it as like a conflict of interest to let Ebony be the prosecutor. Um, I don't know. I feel like they probably, well, obviously it makes sense for the story. But if I was Dale, I would have let someone else do that because there's obviously some hatred or some personal conflicts with, with Ebony and Ty or Ebony and Danny. Well, I think I think it's unavoidable in a tribe this size. Yeah. Because you could say that about every trial, that the defense or the prosecution, it is a conflict of interest on both of their parts right. because of how they feel. You know what I mean? So Absolutely. I just don't think it's, I think it's unavoidable at this point. Because you could say the same thing about Bray defending Danny. Yeah. Right. You know, Absolutely. you could say he has a more invested interest in defending her than Ebony has in getting rid of her. You know, um, <laughs> That's actually, you're absolutely right. And that's actually really wild to think that Dale is probably like, okay, who's defending Danny? And then Bray's like, I am. He's like, what? Uh, aren't you two sleeping together? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, this also just shows how useless this Bill of Rights is because this should have been like, I don't know. I feel like the rest of the tribe leaders should be aware of this. And should have been like the judges, or at least, you know, just something of importance for this. Thank you. Why is this mm -hmm. a private trial happening yeah. just among the mall rats when Danny has literally been accused of trying to murder the one person the city is aware of knows the formula? Where mm -hmm. are, where's anybody else? Like, why, like, come on. What is the point of the Bill of Rights when it literally only comes into play, I think, once? After all of this, and it's because one person stole from the marketplace. That's mm -hmm. it. Like, there is no point to the Bill of Rights. After no. all that hoopla to make it come happen, we have these horrible things happen, and it never refers to the Bill of Rights. I'm like, this was what you drew up, Danny. This was your system of government. You drew this up, Danny. Like, this is twisted. This is a real, this is a mess. You spent all that time writing this up, and nobody thought, to edit it or improve it because you didn't do a good job, honey. This is a freshman English essay. It's awful. Uh, right. Yeah. And, you know, and that's usually what's going to happen 
when someone tries to govern a group of individuals by themselves and not with a whole, uh, I guess, system of people <laughs> uh, to work along with. Um, yeah, but the trial was just so... I mean, and then Ebony was asking her all these questions that were kind of not related to the whole murder thing. Because at that point, someone should have stopped it right there and said this is easily a, a, a pers- personal interest. She's leading the witness, Your Honor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that was her goal. Yeah, just to, sh- mm-hmm. to see as much doubt as possible so everyone goes like, oh yeah, we don't know, we don't know, we don't really know her. We don't really know where she come from, what she's doing. She could be a spy. That's, that was the whole point, just to that doubt. I've, I, I swear to God, if I was on trial, no, not like on trial, but if I was protecting Danny, I'd be like, so what if you don't know her? So what if she's a spy? Ty Zan is the true spy. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, I just loved Alice, like, just to step in, like, this is all a farce. We all know Ebony did it. Just come ask her. Like, that's how I felt about the whole trial. Like, thank you, Alice. Mm-hmm. So Alice was, feeling. She was the audience. Like, are you kidding me? We're wasting our time on this. We all know who did this. Come on. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? I think it's another subcon- or conscious, conscious thing that everyone in this entire tribe knows that Ebony did it. They're just indulging themselves like oh finally something entertaining is happening yeah let's let this play out let's just see how it goes yeah i think ebony's greatest card she has to play is that while obviously danny isn't the obvious culprit of trying to get rid of tyson like when you really think about it she's not the obvious culprit for that but she's a really good distraction from the culprit because there is something off about danny you know Mm -hmm. and that's what ebony's making the group focus on like she's making them focus on how much do we know about her, the inconsistencies in Danny's story, and like that's what's working. And she's smart. She questions Danny on her story because it is odd. We've said it ourselves. What the frick was Danny doing before she ended up in that building? Coincidentally, just running into Bray. What was she doing there? You know? And she doesn't, she didn't think her story out. She never covered her tracks. You know, for someone who's so scared of ever being caught, she didn't think of a good backstory for why she was even in that building. You know, if, if Ebony had asked me, how, what a coincidence that you're in one of the only three buildings that, the, you know, the formula was worked on, I'd be like, I guess it is. I didn't know that. You know what I mean? I'm just looking for shelter and stuff. I would never admit I was looking for the antidote, you know, because now you just screwed yourself over. Like, Danny's her own worst witness. It's all, all Ebony had to do was pick at her, pry at her, break down her sense of like, you're safe, this is not going to work. That's all she's doing. She's just hammering at Danny and Danny ends up breaking, you know, and um, I'm just like, that's what Ebony does. She knows how to pull the strings and you give yourself away. She, that's all she had to do. Just wait for Danny to break. And then Bray is just like, uh, I never thought of any of this. And now I've got questions. (laughs) <laughs> um. He was like, the defense was, can we have five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, did, Bray never thought anything suspicious about meeting this girl. Never questioned their meeting. Like, oh my God, how many gears do you have up there turning, Bray? <laughs> Good Lord. The moment he saw her, he's like, huh, she's living in a government building. She has this weird crossbow. Oh, she's pretty. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm going to tell her everything about my tribe and her objective <laughs> and bring her home. And my dead girlfriend. Yep. <laughs> like, wow, Bray. <laughs> Again, you're just so lucky that Danny wasn't the most evil person ever. She's unhinged, but she's not evil. You're lucky. The only thing in Ebony's uh, arguments that I do think she kind of put, she's trying to overreach is when she considers Danny to be a chosen spy. I get why she does mm-hmm. it, but I feel like she's, a, she's overreaching a bit because while you can definitely call into question Danny's origins and what her motivations might be and that, you know, she might have nefarious purposes or that she might have just tried to kill Tysan because she didn't want anyone in the way of her Bella rights, which is where she should have stuck. That's where she should have stuck it at. That's the one thing she could probably prove. Trying to say that Danny wanted to destroy the antidote for the Chosen, there's zero evidence to suggest that. Like, it doesn't work at all. And anyone with half a brain would be like, wait a minute, 
that argument doesn't hold up because Danny hasn't done a single thing to support the idea that she wants to get rid of the antidote. You know, um, everything she's done is, yeah, I want to be in charge. Like, you could say she's a spy, but not to destroy the antidote, not for the chosen. That doesn't make any, any sense. You know, say she's a spy for someone else. I get it. She, you know, put two to two together, two evils. I get it. But I'm just like, wait a second. Ebony, that was a dumb argument to make right there. The chosen don't want the antidote. Yeah. You know, and Danny had any oppor- every opportunity to try to get rid of it. And said she has been a proponent to getting it out there, you know. Yeah, she could have easily put something else in there when they were handing it out. Yeah, I mean, in all honesty, this case should have ended like five minutes after they found out Bob was dead. Because, I mean, well, maybe not. Well, uh, they're kids. I mean, there's just anyone could have put that thing there in her in her bedroom. I don't. I don't think of all the evidence they found, it doesn't warrant to one locking Danny up and then two putting her on trial. Yeah, but I think what Ebony's doing there is he's playing with the fact that Danny made this bill of rights saying what had to be done about certain things and is using it to just simply using it against her. Yeah. I mean she's 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 doing what the what the media normally does. Not really bringing any facts but just motivating people through their emotions to come to a judgment about uh, a human being or uh, a topic. Yeah, and she's good at that. She knows what she's doing. And she knows she's capable of getting people to believe whatever she tells them to. Yeah, like, she she is definitely preying on the emotional subconscious of everyone. Because I'm looking at Danny, and I know she didn't try to kill Ty Sam. But I'm like, Dude, I know you're hiding something. I don't trust you. I don't really like you. So what is it you're hiding in? And it's like, you can almost make them forget that the whole point of this trial is to find Tyson's killer. Mm -hmm. And you get them to emotionally focus on that sense of unease they've always had about Danny, just in general. Mm -hmm. You know, steer them toward that. Like, what is with you? You are weird, Danny. Where did you come from? Mm -hmm. And of course, you've been trying to take over our tribe. You completely got our leader in a mind meld. The guy can't make a decision on his own anymore. (laughs) Like, what is your deal? You know, what do you want? And again, it doesn't help that Danny has been pushing a bill of rights, a rule of law over the city. You know, and when you add that to everything else, it's just suspicious. Like, that's sus. Yeah. I did find it interesting that she went into the but we don't know anything about her, about her past. Like, how much did the others know about each other's past? That's true. I mean, we don't know anything about Tizan. We don't know anything about Ryan um, or Chloe or a lot of people. And I think it's what, like, that's the only reason that works is because of everything else in Danny's behavior. Mm -hmm. That's why it works. That where did she come from? What is her, because Danny acts so secretive and just, she's off. Like, if Danny didn't act like any of that, if she wasn't interested in the Bill of Rights, if she was just another background character, the fact that we don't know her past wouldn't matter. She wouldn't be a good suspect for this. But Danny put herself front and center and started taking over and always having something to say and, like, Bray, you have to do this. The Marats, you have to do this. All of that is suspicious. And even if it was because she really did want to make things right, it doesn't look good for her. She didn't make any friends. She didn't make any allies. You know, so even people who might have been like, well, I thought she just wanted to help people. I'm going to remember all the time she screamed at them. I remember she was mean to them. The fact that she didn't actually seem like she ever wanted to help them. They're going to be like, well, I, I actually don't believe she wants to help anyone. She certainly never helped me. She was never nice to me, you know, and it's like, it sucks. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's where it falls down, though, in a way, because you have to look at the person who's forcing this issue, and it's Ebony. <laughs> <laughs> like, we are the locos she's come over she's now a tribe leader like eh, really i <laughs> are you all that dumb <laughs> yeah, you know maybe they are that dumb it's almost the entire tribe series kind of plays out like invader zim if anyone's ever seen that show where everyone on that show is really dumb except for the dib character and he knows exactly what's going on but yet everyone is just oblivious to what's really happening like really what really annoyed me was like when alice um said it's ebony 
it cuts to a, a, a scene with everyone's reaction. You see Jack going, oh, really? <laughs> like, well, <laughs> why are you shocked, Jack? <laughs> it could be Ebony. <laughs> it's just, yeah. yeah I don't it know. is. It, I mean, we already know these guys are pretty dumb, unfortunately. <laughs> it sucks, but yeah, they are pretty dumb. And it does make very little sense that it never occurred to any of them that Ebony likely had something to do with this. Everything they know about Ebony. Everything Ebony has ever done. It's just weird. I I guess Celine kind of chalks it up to what they must be thinking when Celine says, I don't like her, I don't trust her, but I trust Bray, and he says, we need her. So maybe it's just the fact that they trust Bray so much that they can't fathom <laughs> that <laughs> this would get past him. If he says that Ebony can be trusted, they're like, well, I trust him. I if, if I don't have that, I have nothing. So mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. I'm I want to say that I was smarter at this age. In some ways I was, and in other ways I wasn't. So, but yeah, I do think it's weird that everybody's overlooking Ebony, the most obvious suspect. She'd be the first person I think if someone died. Like <laughs> you mean the former local leader? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, two final questions about the trial. Like, did you enjoy the little flashbacks um, to the, what they were talking about? And yeah, what did you make of Patsy and Chloe not being included, whereas Casey was? Uh, so annoyed for them. I don't even get it. It didn't make sense. What the fuck are you doing, Bray? Are you trying to say maybe he was like, you girls are too emotionally involved because Bob died and you won't be fair anyway? Maybe he thinks he's doing them a favor by keeping them completely uninvolved. Whatever. Um, I agree with the girls. It was sexist. But, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, the Bob argument is the only one that's even slightly acceptable in this case. But yeah, I'm with, I'm with the girls. It does not make sense that they tell them they're too young while KC gets to stay. I agree. I think they should have stayed, but they were definitely well. Uh, uh, the the trial in itself is just crazy. <laughs> but I think if they would have stayed, maybe they would have had a different opinion. Maybe, but even they weren't there. They still, with no facts and evidence, they still thought that Danny was uh, the reason why Bob died. Yeah, they want to see her burn. Yeah, so, I mean, maybe, maybe Bray had a point in deciding that they wouldn't be good on a jury because they're too biased. They want to, They already believe Danny did it before there is any evidence that Danny had anything to do with it or any motive for doing it. And I mean, they're the first to say, did you hear? It looks like Danny's with the Chosen. You know what I mean? It's like, you guys are even... Chloe, this is Chloe, our intuitive mm -hmm. little Chloe is so angry about Bob's death that that doesn't seem weird to her. She just immediately believed what Ebony had thrown out there. So maybe Bray's right. They didn't belong on the jury. They couldn't have a clear head about this. And I don't blame them because I couldn't have a clear head if she'd murdered my dog. So, right. <laughs> I, mean, he's, he's, the witch. I mean, he's right and he's wrong. I mean, just the fact that he says, you cannot do it because she she might have or might not have murdered your dog. You're... You're, you're too much attached to this. Now, excuse me while I go defend the woman I'm sleeping with. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, if he wanted to pull the you guys are too young card, he should have sent KC with them. Yeah, he should have just been honest with them. Like, look, you know, in a real court of law, because the victim is so close to you, you you're not allowed to be on the jury. You know what I mean? Um, because telling them they're just too young is condescending. And, of course, they're not dumb. They're like, so in one case, the other jury is the same age as us. He just told them it's because Bob was so close to you and he meant so much to you. That's why. And just tell them that's the way it worked before. You wouldn't have been allowed on the jury. I think the girls would have understood that. They would have been mad, but they wouldn't have felt condescended to. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like you're just lying to us, you know, and treating like we're idiots. But, you know, whatever. Bray's uh, just... <laughs> He's not good. I wouldn't want him to be my defense lawyer. <laughs> no, give me Ebony. I'd be like, <laughs> Alice? <laughs> Alice, you want to help me out here? And did you like the flashbacks cut in? Um, I do think they're, 
they're good for the back row. Anybody who hasn't had a ch- hasn't been able to follow the story and pick up on these important things. Maybe you just stepped into the show. You have no idea what the frick is going on. These flashbacks let you know what the frick actually happened. They let you know that Bray that Bray no gave the antidote formula to Ebony. So like, oh, that's not true. They let you know who actually did this. So I think that's what it's there for for anybody mm-hmm. who hasn't been keeping up with the serial. You know, like, this is what's actually happening, and this is what the defense and the prosecution are saying, so that you're all caught up. Um, so, it's just, like, making sure that anybody watching this knows everything, you know, knows what's being a lie and what's not a lie. So, and, and again, anybody who might have missed those details because they're young or whatever, like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, Ebony's lying. You know, there is somebody, she knows the formula, you know. Speaking to the back row, catching people up, I guess. It works. It's very dramatic. <laughs> it, it's, it's a tribe. I would love to watch this with someone who's never seen the tribe before, and they just watch this episode for the first time, and they can just see how evil Ebony is. <laughs> Impressive evil tree or evilness, villainy. That's it. Impressive villainy. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But at least our group of kids is consistently stupid in every trial. So there's mm-hmm. always that. <laughs> there's never any trial where they're smart. <laughs> I was going to say, has there been one actually good trial <laughs> in the whole series? I still really like the Jack trial. I think it does a good job of what it's doing. I actually like this one for its theatrics. I think it's <laughs> fun to watch. It's so entertaining. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I... The kids are consistently stupid. The best trial, I, I, I also top my head, I might feel differently later when we get to the episode, but I think the best trial right, I'd rank would be Luke's. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it was handled the best, um, where the audience, the, you know, the jury's not stupid to believe whatever they believe, you know, but I might feel differently when we get there, so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we all will. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Okay, Um, so that leads us to our final thoughts of the episode. So as Ebony's question of Danny turns to her past and how she came to be in the government building where Bray found her, Danny's story begins to unravel and Bray is forced to call for an adjournment. Pleading with her to trust him with the truth, Danny finally admits to him that the building was for her father's office and that he was the one in charge of the Pandorix project that led to the creation of the virus. So... Yeah, panel. do you remember, thinking about your immediate thoughts to that revelation, and how do you feel about it now? I, this might be one of my favorite reveals mm-hmm. in the show. Sometimes you have a story where someone has to keep a secret, and we don't know what the secret is. And, you, you know, in hindsight, you think if they had just said what the secret was, they would have avoided a lot of problems. And then finally, the secret is revealed. You find out what this person has been hiding. And it's really, it can be disappointing. Like, really, that's mm-hmm. that's what you were hiding? That's what you let all of this stuff happen? I gotta say, finding out what Danny's father did, I was like, yeah, this was a good secret to keep to yourself. Mm-hmm. I, I get it. Like, who boy, it changes everything. This was a satisfying reveal for freaking Danny. All the things I felt about her. I didn't, I'm not saying it made me like love her, think, oh my gosh, I changed my mind about you. Just this was a good reveal for a secret that causes so many problems and why Danny was literally willing to consider going to her grave with this secret. I buy it. Like, yeah, I would have kept that to myself too. It just makes so much sense now. (laughs) Like, okay, why would you tell anybody that? Like, I get it. Like, that's a secret you keep to yourself. No matter what the consequences mm-hmm. are, like I, I buy that, you know. Um, and it was worked in really well, you know. All the little scenes with Jack and Allie trying to persuade her to help them, or their, you know, their wishes to expand the research and to mm-hmm. find out what happened, and her holding them off. It all makes sense now because, yeah, she doesn't want them to look into that any further. Because they might find out who she is, who her dad was. And I get wanting to keep that hidden. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I said it in a, in a video I made um, about this whole secret revealing. Honestly, uh, yeah, best secret revealing ever on the show. 
absolutely great. Finally, we have something interesting to talk about uh, with with Danny because she really needed this for her character. Um, but to the point of me hearing her say this, I also thought like, oh, how cool, how amazing. But I still didn't like her character. Uh, really, I still thought she was annoying and and whiny and all this stuff. But now I felt like okay, now I can understand why she's complaining so much about wanting to help the city and why she's whining about uh, people not doing their part for the city. It's because she feels responsible mm-hmm. for everything that's happened, uh, even though it's completely not her fault. But she she feels that way. So now it makes sense why she's like batman and she's taking the city under her reign and she's like everything has to be my way or the highway i still don't like danny i'll never like her as a character you know what i mean i don't like the way she's written i'm sorry ella you did your best sweetheart i like you i think you're cute as a button just don't like the character um but i will say in this moment when she has to tell bray i think ella doesn't fantastic job i actually felt something for this character i um I'm looking at her and she's like, you've been good to me, Bray, you know, and, uh, I trust you. You can see in that moment, she really does. Mm-hmm. And when she has to tell him, I'm like, what the heck have you been carrying girl? And when I heard what she says, I was like, damn, okay, okay, let's get the tea out. Let's get the wine. We need to stop and we need to sit. I'm willing to talk to you now because, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, baby girl, that is a heavy secret to have carried on you. The whole show has been based on this premise that a virus wiped out 50% of the population. And you've been carrying the weight of knowing who it was. You know what I mean? Being related to that person. Ella does a fantastic job. It's so genuine and sincere that she gets Mm -hmm. to be. I see a very scared girl who's had to carry this. And I'm like... Damn, I still don't like you, but kudos. I can't believe you've been carrying this. Here, have some wine. Let's do this. You know, like, I feel for you. I'm with you right now. Let's talk, you know? Yeah. Um, you can honestly say, or at least maybe I would say that from this big reveal, that you can kind of say that Danny has like the most potential to be like the best tribe character. If obviously if she would have stayed because she's mm-hmm. given so much of a of a plot point that is so uh, detrimental to the entire story that intertwines every single character, all the ones that have died and all the ones that are uh, still doing, w- you know, whatever. She definitely had potential. I'll give you that. Mm-hmm. But they never use it in season two. I'm just they never used it. They never actually give Danny a chance to live up to even a fraction of that potential throughout the entire season and this was the only season they gave her i think if they had done more maybe she would have stuck around but they thought this was enough and then they didn't do anything else with her and um so while there's potential they never used it i can only imagine what danny could have been once these shackles were removed once this fear once this cloak was removed from her shoulders the kind of person and character she could have been Mm -hmm. But they were like, oh, well, we didn't write anything else for you. But we're going to give you Amber's leftovers, and that's all you're going to be. And that's it. Danny never got the chance to be anything other than the secret holder of something. And then they did nothing with it. Yeah, it almost kind of makes me feel like, then why even give her that amazing of a plot (laughs) plot device? (laughs) I think if Sabine is correct, and Danny was meant to be a separate character while Amber was still in the show just happened to have this secret. It might have worked better because having some side characters mm-hmm. kind of just in the background, unsuspecting, joins the mall rats, you know, is gung ho, supporting Amber, wanting to, you know, fix the world, have a bill of rights, all that stuff, but still not a main character. And then all this stuff happens and this is revealed about them. I think it might have worked better, but because of who Danny had to replace and suddenly take center stage, and suddenly become a full flesh character that wasn't really seen for her, I think that's it's why it ends up falling flat, you know, because this was the thing that distinguished Danny, but it was the only thing that distinguished Danny. Everything else she has was left over from Amber. And, um, so yeah, I guess she was just a victim of circumstances. Yeah, that's why I keep thinking that must have been it. It's a shame. 
It's a shame, but it is what it is. It's what we got. And in this moment, great reveal. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it's a great reveal. Of all the secrets I've ever seen in a story, where you finally find out what someone's been hiding, this is one of the most satisfying, like, okay, I get it. Enough said. Mm-hmm. I, got, I got it. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I because uh, there are plenty of secrets I can reveal. You're like, but still, <laughs> like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know. But this one, I was like, questions answered. <laughs> I don't have any more for her. I got it. I understand completely. Okay. <laughs> I think you know what. My fourth time watching this after that huge secret reveal, I was like, oh yeah. Now they need to reveal about Tyson's secret next. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any other secret could have been. Any good. I mean, think about it. Think about how relevant this secret is. There is not a single mm-hmm. thing we could learn about any of these characters that would matter as much as this. Nothing. There's nothing we could have learned about any of these people that would actually mm-hmm. matter, you know. But finding out that this person's father is the reason the world is the way it is, the reason our world ended, mm-hmm. that is the most relevant and important secret you could possibly yeah. have in this universe. Nothing's going to top it. So kudos to Danny for getting this. <laughs> you will be yeah. memorable forever for having this. I was going to say that last point, the, the fact that it is so important, is this, that's the only thing that makes yeah. me think that it, it, it would have been for Amber. I don't think they would have not given it to a main character if Amber had been there and then there was this kind of side character of Danny. I, I still don't think they would have given it to her. It would have, it would have been Amber's story, I still believe. I don't agree with you, but I understand your reasoning. It's so big of a plot point is so important to the show I, I don't think they would have given it to a side character unfortunately we will never know okay cool so that brings series 2 episode 21 to a close thank you very much to the panel if you'd like to take part in a future episode of the podcast you can fill out the form over on the website the uk, or send us a message on our facebook page so we'll see you next time for episode 22 until then bye bye later bye